litigation issues arising out of nuclear crimes. The focus of our discussion today will be the current status of Fukushima and the health effects that are occurring from the transport of radioactive particles and contamination in our air, precipitation, oceans, and food supply. Loren, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much, and I'm very happy to be on your program again. It's wonderful to, um, to do interviews with you, and thank you so much for asking me today. Well, you have been exposing the fact that we have been nuclear guinea pigs since 1945. That's right. And I would like to start with the current status of the Fukushima plant two years into the accident. It's uh, not good for us, that's for sure. First, when that happened on March 11th, 2011, it was a disaster that the world has never imagined was even possible. And what makes it worse, especially for me, is to understand very clearly that it was deliberate. I did uh, a series of interviews, which I will send you the links, and you can post them on your, your site or do whatever you want to with them. And I've been, I was reporting who was involved, the politicians, the politics of vested interests, the international financiers. And of course, I had done extensive research and discovered the actual transmitter was at Tromso in Norway. And that facility, that harp facility, is owned by a consortium of countries. That would be England is number one, Uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland, China, Japan, and Germany. And this is part of a network of global transmitters with uh, many, many, many bases in Antarctica. And that's very curious because Britain has nine And that has never been revealed until about a week ago when the Daily Mail had photographs in a story on a portable uh, Antarctic base, which they can tow around uh, behind uh, some kind of propulsion vehicle if they want to move it around. It's kind of like a bunch of boxcars, like a train. And also, the U.S. has... um, at least three bases in Antarctica. Russia has seven. The Japanese have at least three. Probably Australia has some. And um, so we were beginning to understand now that this is a a criminal cabal of countries and uh, vested interests, individuals and, and corporations involved. And the hidden agenda, of course, 
which is so horrible to understand is depopulation. And it's also to uh, bring about a very, very major transformation, which is um, now happening, and that is to destroy the Western economy. And that would be include Europe, uh, North America, and Japan. And in order to pump China the, and India, too. So what they're creating in China and India are middle classes who will be, they're huge countries with very large populations. And so it's a whole new market for the bankers to make loans, to cause wars, to sell food that they are now growing in third world countries. 70% of the almond crop from California, which is probably some of the best almonds in the world, is going to the new growing middle class in China and India. So there are many, many uh, interested parties, invested interests, and of course, this is all being carried out by the U.S. Navy and navies in other countries that are the top military echelon um, in, in terms of power and control and also control of radioactive and nuclear materials and weapons. So what we know now since those series of interviews, because people can listen to those and uh, get background but today what we want to do is to update people on the last year in particular uh, when more of the effects on the environment, on plants and animals, on Fukushima Prefecture and Northern Japan, the oceans, and uh, North America and Europe and beyond has manifested itself. And all I can say is that the book that uh, Dr. Alexei Yablokov from Russia uh, put together with uh, a lot of other Russian scientists from 500 research papers they produced on the after effects of Chernobyl, which Yablokov translated 500 articles in Russian into English in order to be able to write this book. And it's called Chernobyl, Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment, and it's free on the internet, and I recommend that everyone listening, if they're interested, download it as a PDF. You can also buy it, published and bound and everything. I believe it's 7 or $8, which is um, very, very reasonable. That's just the cost of producing it and mailing it. And um, Professor Yablokov, his name is Y-A-B-L-O-K-O-V, uh, Prime Minister Yeltsin's science advisor. Dr. Yablokov is also a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, and he also was scientific advisor for other uh, presidents and prime ministers of Russia. And, well, on top of that, the Russians really are more familiar with nuclear disasters than probably any other country because they um, had the experience of Chernobyl, which was a global nuclear disaster. And because my mother was exposed to that in um, 1986, uh, she lived in Santa Barbara, California, and most of the world was contaminated, all of it eventually, by Chernobyl. She developed uh, Alzheimer's disease when she was about 46 years old. And I have, uh, I'm not just a scientist, I love all living things. I'm a naturalist. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, the equivalent of a master's degree in wildlife studies at UC Berkeley. And I'm, I'm really um, a very broad uh, environmentalist, so um, I probably notice things or understand things more than most other scientists, although there are some who have also specialized in radiation 
technologies and disasters in, in order to, to warn the public. And, uh, of course, Dr. Yablokov would be one of the very fine scientists who's working very hard to uh, alert the global community. Now, the effects of Chernobyl will be dwarfed very soon or already by the effects of Fukushima. And the emissions from Fukushima into the atmosphere, into the ocean, will not end in our lifetimes, Christina. Um, it's, uh, I I'm overwhelmed every day when I think about the implications and the long-term effects of this disaster. I, I really do uh, feel very bad about it. And on the other hand, I'm very pleased that I can help and I can contribute to the global understanding and also help people learn how to protect themselves and their family and their children and babies. But um, this is uh, pretty overwhelming, even for me. And thank you so much for uh, being one of the bright lights that I can contact and work with and communicate with because it's something you just can't. You just can't deal with it all on your own. You've got to have friends in this business or you would just um, just not make it, I guess. But to compare Chernobyl to Fukushima or Fukushima to Chernobyl, we know from air filters taken from cars in Japan uh, in the month after the uh, disaster that the the Fukushima emissions and radioactive pollution, nuclear pollution of the planet, is at least 300 times that of Chernobyl. I have contacted six, or I've been in contact with six people. Uh, one is a woman who is over 50, and the other five are males under 50, healthy, buff. Uh, there's no reason for them to be sick. And all six of these people had thyroiditis within nine months of the Fukushima disaster. And that would be from the radioactive iodine that was emitted in the, in the, emission, the, um, the emissions major global nuclear disaster, which is affecting all living things. We try to use as much Chernobyl data as possible to try to extrapolate or predict what's coming down the road and, and what um, you have said and a number of other researchers and, and people in the nuclear industry that I've spoken with have said is they are absolutely shocked at some of the numbers of contamination and actually have been disbelieving when I've shared some of this information with some of them, um, 20,000 becquerels per kilogram found in earthworms that were 200 kilometers away from the Fukushima plant. We know that the Chernobyl reactor was half the size of the smallest reactor at Fukushima, that was reactor one. And the, the 300 times figure that we're using, how are you extrapolating the, the data to come to that number in case anyone else wants to duplicate that? Is that just based on the air filter studies? Yes, uh, that's a good question because people um, should know how that comparison was made. I've done about 20 speaking tours in Japan between 2000 and 2010, and I also worked on uh, educating the the public, I'm sorry, the, the lawyers in Japan who were representing the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki who have never won a lawsuit uh, since 1945 against the Japanese government and all they were asking for was health benefits. And Dr. Busby produced a very, very excellent new risk analysis or risk model for the European Union uh, for the Green Party on uh, radiation exposure. And it's the first time there's been a new risk 
model that has been used since 1945, produced by the U.S. military. When I, when I worked with him, uh, I learned a lot. He's very, very clever. And what he did was he got air filters from cars all over uh, northern Japan, especially between Tokyo and Fukushima. People sent him air filters out of their cars, and they also sent the spec on the engine in the cars. So he was able to measure the radiation on the air filter and, uh, and then calculate the volume of air going through the, the car engine. And that uh, was uh, helpful in determining the uh, concentration in the atmosphere. That's where the air was coming from that went through the, the car engine. And he calculated from those numbers, of course, it's an estimate, but nobody's denied it and nobody's done any other estimates that I know of. And he reported the radiation on the air filters indicated that it was at least the equivalent of 300 Chernobyl. Other um, numbers that have come out of the Fukushima disaster was the excess deaths reported by the CDC in the first 14 weeks after the disaster and then through December of 2011. But we haven't had any updates from the CDC since. At least I have not been able to get any current information. We know that there were 40,000 excess deaths from April to December of 1986 following the Chernobyl disaster, but because there are no post-mortem studies done on people who die of sudden heart attacks and things of that nature to look for radioactive contamination or nuclear fallout as the cause, the excess mortality figures are what are used to judge how it's affected populations. And I, I have a difficult time sometimes explaining that to people. Could you explain more about that? Well, first of all, governments, nuclear government agencies, politicians, corporations, the military all have a very, very large vested interest in hiding all of this information from the public. At the CDC, you can actually go on their website and um, vital statistics, in other words, births, deaths, diseases, things like that, are reported every week by every county in the United States to the Centers for Disease Control. And they compile the data uh, and uh, release some of it to the public. The raw numbers are there, but they're just piles of numbers. So it really takes an epidemiologist with very specialized and very sophisticated computer software to crunch those numbers and make uh, meaningful estimates and, and reports. Now, there was an epidemiologist. Nobody knows his real name. It would, would have been very dangerous for him to reveal his identity. But he did crunch those numbers until September or October of 2011. And, um, no, actually, he issued some, uh, a lot of data, maps and stuff, and, and very, very good, very interesting analyses. I'll send it to you. It's a PDF. And um, he was able to say uh, very reliably, and remember, he's a professional epidemiologist with the right software and computers and data, and he said that, 100,000 Americans had died by December of 2011 from Fukushima. 
And the way he determined that was to look at the death rate by region and by cities in the United States going back at least four years before, or maybe even ten years before the Fukushima disaster happened, and then comparing the death rate after that date. And uh, so when you look at all of the deaths, all of the births, um, and you're not looking at specific diseases, it's a much better way to analyze what what is happening. So what you look for are changes and changes that have no explanation. So when you look at a long history like five years or ten years of death rate, it's very easy to see um, that there are so many unexplained there's an unexplained increase which there's no other way to explain it and since it's all over the US and you look at it by region, it confirmed that he was correct because the highest increase in death rates, up to 9 or 10 percent, uh, was in the, the mountain region, which is basically the west slope of the Rocky Mountains, which extend up into Canada and down into Mexico. But I'm only talking about U.S. data. And that would have high rates of rain out and snow out of the fresh Fukushima fission products that come across the Pacific Ocean. And that was very, very interesting. Um, the West Coast also had high radiation rates measured, and they certainly had increases in, in deaths but it was only maybe three and a half or four or five percent. Uh, the mountain region was at least double. And I just want to make sure that people understand that distance from a nuclear accident does not protect you. It's the weather, how much rain and snowfall you have, and it's the geography, whether it's uh, flat or mountainous regions that determine how much radiation ends up in the environment. So we are talking about a very, very complex issue, and each time there's a new nuclear technology introduced uh, or a new nuclear disaster, we learn more. Unfortunately, a lot of people die and even more are hurt. So we're going to see increasing death rates. We're going to see a very large increase in chronic illnesses. And guess who is licking their chops with a napkin around their neck, sitting at the table to pig out on the public? The healthcare industry. Yes, and the bankers and... Uh, I like to travel around a lot in local areas or, or flying across the U.S. I pick up newspapers in every airport or whatever. I gather data everywhere I can. And the I went up to Sebastopol, which is an apple, apple orchard and uh, grape vineyard area, region of Northern California in the wine country. And I was completely shocked at a city council meeting that I attended, the topic for the evening before the, the city council was a petition or a, an application for permits to build on a, a, an empty uh, car lot, and Chase Bank bought it. That's J.P. Morgan, one of the big, big, big New York banking firms. And uh, I was so shocked when they said, and we want to build a CVS pharmacy right next to the bank. And right away, I knew that the bankers own the pharmaceutical companies, the drugstores now, because I've been watching major changes over the last five or ten years in drugstores. And some of the chains have been bought out. CVS is one of the really big new ones 
And when you go into these new drug stores, they have no uh, iodine um, ointment on the shelves. They have no uh, zinc oxide on the shelves. That's what you know you put on to prevent a sunburn or uh, people going outside. Uh, uh, like athletes, put it under their eyes. And um, I just started wondering why those were taken off the shelf. So I went into a pharmacy, and they were happy to order it for me. But these are like $3.5 a tube, and they're essential to family health. And they would be even more essential now since we're going to have an epidemic of chronic illnesses. Since we're not getting the oversight that's really needed for people to understand the amount of contamination and where it's occurring, people can be advocates for their own health and take it upon themselves to determine where they're most at risk and how to avoid it in their daily life because anyone who's studied this disaster knows that there's no way to turn it off. This is something that is continuous until new technology is invented. And in the meantime, there's things that we could be doing to avoid exposure, especially for children, starting with precipitation. And since you are an atmospheric fallout expert, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about that process, the difference between rain and snow, how this stuff moves around in our atmosphere, and what is still contributing to fallout from atmospheric testing. When um, these metals burn that are produced as fission products, uranium is not a fission product, but it does fission and produce the fission product. These are at, at extremely high temperatures. When uranium burns, it gets up to over 5,000 degrees centigrade, which is hotter than the sun. And all that energy that it releases breaks the molecular bonds uh, that hold the mole molecules and atoms together and makes tinier and tinier particles so that basically it produces huge amounts of nanoparticles of the most dangerous, poisonous, radioactive dust that exists on this planet. And these tiny, tiny nanoparticles are highly charged. And because they're very highly charged, they float around the air and in air masses. They're transported all around the, the planet in atmospheric dust. And in the air masses, these tiny particles collect moisture. There's moisture in the air. And so the, the moisture collects or condenses on these tiny particles until they're a drop of rain. And then they fall out of the atmosphere onto the ground with that nuclear uh, particle in the, in the center of the raindrop. And when you have a lot of rain, um, it's very efficient at removing uh, a large amount of the radiation, the, these particles, from the atmosphere. And because the particles are wetted, the surface is wet by the moisture collecting on it, when these particles land on the ground on rocks or soil or plant material or buildings, what it, cars, whatever they land on, they stick with that film of water on the surface of the particle, and there's absolutely no way to clean it off. You cannot wash it off. You can't scrub it off. And it's because the uh, electrical forces, they're called van der Waal forces of attraction between the particle and the surface it lands on uh, are so strong. Uh, other forces that we would use to remove them um, aren't strong enough. So that's good. It removes the particles from the atmosphere, but it's landing on our skin, landing in our hair. Our clothes are contaminated, our umbrellas, our shoes, our raincoats, our, uh, the outside of our cars, and then we track it into the house and we contaminate our own living environment. So 
it's very, very important if you go out in the rain that you leave your rain gear, your rain boots, your hats, everything, gloves outside. Do not bring them into your house and don't wear your shoes inside if you've worn them outside in the rain. In fact, in the 1950s, or yeah, 1950s, President Eisenhower was in the White House. It was pouring rain that day in Washington, D.C. And um, he announced to his staff or whoever was there that, that he was going outside to go somewhere. And um, there were military experts there, and they said, no, you're not going outside today. He said, why not? And they said, well, they're, they're doing nuclear weapons tests in Nevada today, and uh, the atmosphere is, and the rain is completely contaminated. You're not going outside today. They know this is happening, but they're not telling us. Now, the difference between rain and how it scavenges nuclear particles and the snow is quite different and snowflakes are have sharp edges and very very sharp tips and pointy areas and because of that those edges and tips have very high charges higher than the nanoparticles floating around in the atmosphere and so they are the most efficient scavenger of nuclear materials and snow removes 95% of the radiation in the air. It's very, very efficient. And so even uh, avoiding rain is a must, but avoiding snow is uh, absolutely, absolutely critical. And that's why the death rates on the west slope of the Rocky Mountains uh, was almost ten, a 10% 10 increase by Christmas after Fukushima just eight months later uh, than the coastal um, and the, the, the west coast. It, those death rates were lower, which is surprising because you would think the opposite. But there wasn't as much precipitation and no snowfall, um, at least along the coastline in most of California. California turned out to not be such a bad place to be. Uh, but Oregon and Northern California and Washington State, uh, British Columbia, um, they really did have very high doses. It was measured and reported by the EPA until they stopped measuring and reporting. But uh, Dr. Chris Busby, who's a British uh, low-level radiation expert for the British government and the European Union. He warned me very early on. He said, all of these agencies and all of these governments are lying. And what we discovered finally is that the only good data was being reported by the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Monitoring Station. And these are not government funded or controlled or anything. They're private monitoring stations that are privately funded all over the world, and they produce the best data. And um, they had great maps with the plumes coming across the Pacific, and you could see how they were. the plumes were being guided. Cold, dense air uh, basically um, is a, it's all fluid dynamics, just like water. And um, so they just steered those plumes into selected regions and cities for their depopulation um, agenda. And I was just, uh, I, I was aghast when I was watching it. And I was asking other scientists, did you see what they were doing? They were heating, using a harp beam over uh, the executive and the commercial centers of uh, Canada and the U.S. In other words, Toronto and Ottawa. Ottawa is the um, administra administrative, the government center of Canada. Toronto is the commercial center. New York City and Washington, D.C. and the U.S. And so they just put uh, big warm bubbles over those cities and that cold, dense air from Japan, the plumes loaded with radiation, just flowed right around those high-pressure areas. 
Loren, I've had a lot of reports from people, particularly in the Pacific Northwest and along the East Coast around Washington, D.C. and the Virginias, that there's been a lot of low-flying military helicopters. And sometimes it's reported ahead of time that they're conducting background radiation level research. But if it weren't for Fukushima, shouldn't those levels have been unchanged for decades? It seems like they're looking for something specific. Oh, um, I know all about that. First of all, I worked in two nuclear weapons labs, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, which is where the Manhattan Project started. I was working there in the 70s and as a staff scientist and handling uh, radioactive materials and at the Lawrence Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab, which is where HARP was secretly developed under the cover of the Cold War. And the partner, the secret partner developing HARP was the Soviet Union. So I was trained to um, handle nuclear materials and so forth and so on at Livermore. And the, um, there's constant monitoring all over the world. I mean, they, they know, one scientist told me they know every, where every atom of radioactive material is on this planet. And these big black helicopters would come in and land at Livermore. This is at the end of the 80s and, and the 90s. And they had been taking samples out over the Pacific. Uh, of course, they were monitoring for uh, illegal nuclear weapons testing. About a couple of months ago, I heard these helicopters overhead here in Berkeley. And I started looking all over the Internet to see why they were flying, because it was obvious they were here for a week and they were flying on a grid pattern. And um, that's an awfully expensive uh, project uh, to put helicopters in the air all day for day after day. And they were also at a certain altitude, about 300 feet, I believe. Well, it came out in a couple of local newspapers that it was the Department of Energy or the military, probably the Department of Energy because they came out of Las Vegas, um, that they were doing a radiation survey from the coastal city of Pacifica, which is south of San Francisco, across San Francisco, across San Francisco Bay, and over the city of Berkeley and the Berkeley Hills. I knew right away they were doing a transit from the coastline to the foothills of the coast ranges and that it was to measure radiation because I also saw vehicles with air monitors on top of the um, on top of the vehicles, I've seen them before, and they were driving through all their neighborhoods while the helicopters were overhead. And then it came out later that they were um, they admitted they were doing a radiation survey. So I, of course, knew it was to measure the radiation from Fukushima. And uh, then, not just a few months ago, um, I think it was after Christmas they were doing the same survey over Washington, D.C. These are military Department of Energy surveys to um, get a baseline, basically, for the radiation levels. And um, this is a horrible thing to say, but we're not any different from the Iraqis, the Afghanis, the Lebanese, uh, the poor people in Gaza. Uh, they are uh, measuring, they're dropping nuclear materials on these populations, and then they're measuring the levels. The information from Iraq uh, was directly uh, called in every day to Dick Cheney's office when he was vice president. And I realized when I studied all that data for Iraq that they were determining how much more they had to bomb them to get a certain radiation contamination level to reach a certain kill rate that they had uh, predetermined. So that's really what they're doing in the U.S. And, and all over the world. The U.N. no doubt is involved too. They were doing it during the nuclear bomb test. They're doing, they've done it with the nuclear power plants. So it's, um, it's basically to 
to determine a kill rate or, or a contamination level, that how much it needs to be increased to achieve their kill rate agenda.